Welcome to episode 283 of the DFO Rundown. It is trade deadline week in the National Hockey League. As always, brought to you by Botano.ca. And uh, lots of big games, of course, uh, the Leafs and the uh, the Bruins on Monday, the Bruins and the Orders later on. The Predators, winners of eight in a row, have uh, put themselves right in the uh, playoff picture. So the game starts now at Botano.ca. Dot .ca and of course uh NBA if that tickles your fancy uh March Madness is coming up oh my goodness you'll have lots of opportunities there as well at patano.ca I am uh, Jason Greger as we welcome in Frank Saravalli as we are 4 days away Frank from the uh NHL trade deadline it's it's being quiet but I I can comfortably say it's going to heat up this week no doubt and it feels like at the same time magically enough we got at least some clarity on the playoff picture. I think the 16 teams that are in right now are the 16 teams that you'll see drop the puck on night one okay. in April. True or false? Buying or selling? That's a good question uh, early on. So Philly's going to hold off the Islanders and Washington, like Pittsburgh, who brutal weekend for them. Yeah, the it's hard Dev- to argue that. Like, Devils had at- a brutal... I mean, honestly, you who had a... Okay, here's question number two to start the pod. Who had a worse road trip out west? Pittsburgh or New Jersey? God, I might say New Jersey because the teams they lost to. Uh, that's who I would say. Yeah. I was- mean, that's as bad and as lifeless as it gets. Did you hear Darren Pang doing the, the Devils no. game the other day? No. He said, I might have gotten my 28th win in the NHL playing net for the oh, Kings. It's a good line. Oof. I mean, he said, look, even at my age, there was nothing to do. No work. They yeah. lose to the Ducks 4-3, oh. the Kings 5-1, and the Sh- they beat the Sharks 7-2. Congrats, you beat the Sharks. Yeah. Now, Dostal, I, I will say, Dostal played unreal in that game against the Fine. Ducks. Fine. Yeah. But yeah, you, can't, just, you gotta you don't want to get goalied this late in the year. We're too we're too far past that. Like yeah. you can't hang your hat on, oh well, we got goalied. Like find a way. You've got a significant talent disparity. And I think the big problem with the devil's talent disparity is that their talent doesn't work. Well, and look at New Jersey's next nine games, Frank. They play Florida, they play Dallas. Carolina, the Rangers, Vegas, Winnipeg. Now, not in that order, right? They got St. Louis and Arizona and Pittsburgh in the middle. But you're playing six really good teams in your next nine games. Like, you got to try to make up ground. It's much harder when you're playing the top teams in the league. If you're Tom Fitzgerald, would you trade Tyler Toffoli? Yes. I agree. You're not winning with him right now. How much is moving him going to damage your chances? I think there are issues way extend beyond that and i don't know that keeping him is going to help you at all yeah like and i know it it doesn't happen often but it has and you know you could roll the dice if he loves it that much in new jersey you give him a chance to go for a cup and say hey man you want to come back in the summer we can revisit i know the odds are super low but you get more if he loved it that much he would have already re-signed yeah well that's fair but some guys never do and then you know it is rare like nick bukestad's kind of a rarity we saw that in arizona um, but yeah, Tyler Toffoli, I'll tell you, Frank, if, if he, and I, I said it all along, I think some of the teams are waiting. Uh, you know, you look at the asking price, Tyler Toffoli at what he's done last year, what he's doing this year, what he's done in his career, won a cup. Like he checks a lot of boxes. If you're looking for a, a nice solid second line, right winger. He also Hello, has a clutch factor, I think to his game that I think is pretty attractive too. Well, Colorado, Vegas, and Edmonton could all use Tyler Toffoli and L.A. Well, L.A. just isn't going to have the cap space, though. Yeah. they Adrian Kempe is expected back before the end of the season, so there's not going to be a big opening there for them to do something unless they're moving a piece off their roster. That's the tough spot. And I, if you're if you're Rob Blake, how aggressive would you be? given where your team is. Do they deserve it? Yeah, that's another fair point. Yeah. So Tyler DeFoley started last week at number 44 out of 45 on my trade targets board. Yeah. Likely to be inside the top 10 when the new board comes out later today. Hmm. 
so then the next question since we just worked through the devils is the penguins hey dude well here here's the thing about the penguins frank so i've been doing a little bit of digging on the penguins i'm not i'm not 100 percent sold to do, like i get the sense that they might try to re-sign gensel at around like 8.5 and ship off a lot of other guys right you've you've you have riley smith on your board higher and it makes a lot of sense right they, they got ricard raquel they got some other guys if they can get teams to to trade that i wouldn't be shocked if jake gensel ends up re-signing in pittsburgh and they trade out a lot of other guys marcus Pedersen, uh you know Ra raquel riley smith etc and free up some space and then try to get a better set of complementary players so then why haven't the penguins and jake gensel had even an exploratory discussion on on an extension wow ah, i don't question. think it's even a remote possibility Okay. I mean, I guess it would be a remote possibility to, uh, I have to allow for that, but I would be very surprised given the tenor of how things have gone, not in a negative way. It's just, it hasn't happened. Wouldn't yeah, you have started exploring that in December, January, let alone last summer? Yeah. Well, you can make the argument. Like I just look at Pittsburgh and right now, Frank, I'm not, you know, we talked about the San Jose Sharks never really committing to wanting to do what they're supposed to do. And I find that Pittsburgh, now Pittsburgh's a little bit different because they have Sidney Crosby who's having a really good year, right? And they got Latang and they got Malkin who finally scored, uh, albeit a garbage time goal, but still goal's a goal when you score. And they're committed to those guys long-term. So I think the fact that they're committed, you know, looking to say, okay, how is it possible to keep the best guy of our, our free agents or other guys, which is Jake Gensel by a mile, to me, it would make sense to explore it. And, you know, why they haven't, maybe they're just doing it internally. Then they come to them and say, hey, here's an offer. I don't know. But, um, you know, maybe they look and say, hey, we got some months to do it. Obviously, it's a risk if you don't do it before the deadline. I totally understand that. But other teams have, you know, rolled that dice and ended up re-signing their guy before uh, July 1st. I, I just, I don't get it. I, I mean... I'm looking at this Penguins team and they're just, I know that we talked and I don't want to add any fuel to it, but we talked a couple weeks ago about how poorly they're constructed. Like they needed that Eric Carlson contract, like another hole in their head. Yeah, no, it wasn't great. I don't, it, this is not, and again, this is the exact same consistent message I had. Go back and rewind to our summer pod in August when they made the trade. I said it then they didn't need him. And now they're in a spot where think about not just the cap space. Like they had $10 million that they committed to him. How different would this team have been if you got three players? Oh, I know. I, yeah. I don't, it, they really, instead of this conversation with Sidney Crosby this week about, you know, uh, you know, we, we need to address this and, and trading Crosby's winger. It really should be an apology of how badly they mismanaged this over two different regimes, because yeah. it, it's really a shame that this all world season from Crosby, honestly, one of the best 36 year old seasons in NHL history how do we, how did we drop the ball? That's got to be the question. Yeah, uh, no, it's, it, but there's no quick fix. And there's no quick fix of, oh, you know what? We move out a few guys and we're going to go in the free agent market and get all these value contracts and everything's going to work out great. That's got to be their plan. I don't see any other way around it. Um, unless they go to a rebuild, Frank. And I just, I, I don't see him there yet. Do you? No, but like he, here's to further emphasize my point. So you bring in Carlson 10, Riley Smith 5 is 15, Nolachari 2 is 17, Lars Eller 2.45 is 19.45. What about Ricard Raquel? Multiple that years. Was, no, five. but that was there before. I'm talking just yeah. Kyle. Oh, just, okay. 19.45. Oh, and I didn't add in Ryan Graves. Yeah. So 23. It's 20. Yeah. 24 million bucks. 
They added 24. I know they traded some away, but they added $24 million in changes. That's more than a quarter of the cap. And this team is going to be worse off this year than they were last year. Yeah. Worse. Yeah, like they're like you look at their roster on paper and you say, How is how is Philadelphia nine games ahead of the Pittsburgh Penguins? Nine points ahead of the Pittsburgh Penguins. It, it makes no Five sense. Five more wins. Makes no sense. No, like I know the Pens, they've got their games in hand. They're gonna have to pray they win all of them. And then, you know, that like that's their only hope here. But I'm I'm really curious to, to watch Third what they one. do this. You week. can stick a fork in them after that loss to Calgary on Saturday night. Oh, I saw God. one of the Penguins writers tweeted and he said someone should bet their house on the Oilers on Sunday because there was no way they were recovering from that loss. Yeah, well, and you throw in the fact that their plane was frozen in Calgary and then they, they didn't get to their hotel, I think, until like 4 a.m. Yeah, he tweeted that before that happened. Oh, yeah. No, no but I'm just saying you add that into it and yeah, it was... Uh... It was an easy one. If if you were at Botano.ca, Frank, you would have made uh, you would have made good on that one for sure. So, um, yeah, you could tell the frustration talking to Crosby after the game last night. He was, uh, you know, he was not impressed. Um, like that that game really was a, you know, Pittsburgh used to be, but the orders beat up on the Penguins, Frank. How about thirty to nine? Is how they've outscored in their last five meetings. Like, it's an ass kicking every time right now. Like it's. You know the uh, you got the young guy in McDavid and against you know the, the the great Crosby and right now the the depth on the team is just between the two it's a ca- it's massive it's like a, a canyon between the two teams when they play this, head this road trip solidified it in the sense that there have been believers the whole time somehow that this team that hasn't won a playoff series since 2018 would be able to sneak in and then could potentially do some damage. There can't be one person left in that front office, one person left in that locker room that could look anyone dead in the eye and say that this team has a chance not only to make the playoffs, you can cross that off, but to do any damage, to do anything other than to sell every piece off that you possibly could would be doing this team a giant disservice. Yeah, no, I would agree. Now, let uh, the Washington Capitals, Frank, uh, got a lot of players we think could be traded potentially. Uh, Kuznetsov uh, comes out of the, uh, you know, NHLPA uh, substance abuse program and uh, gets put on waivers and is uh, now going to go to the minors. You know, the the GM talked about how he felt like, you know what, he just needs to change. Um, Do you see this going down buyout street in the summertime? What do you see happening? Oh, I don't, I'd be surprised if it's a buyout. I think that they'd just be just as soon to let him languish. Um, I don't think any agent at this point, given the the dollars left on the deal, uh, it's right now it's about $10 million in cash between now and June, 2025. Given his reputation, which he's now earned, um, I don't. I don't know how you could make the case that he that he should terminate his deal. That seems crazy. Well, because you the- look if if they bought him out, um, he's seven point eight cap hit next year. A buyout uh, in twenty twenty four twenty five is three point eight, so they'd save four million, and then they'd have two million the, the year after. It's actually a pretty good buyout. If, if you wanted to do it for Washington and you know, like, you know, you look at this, Frank, obviously he's um, you know, there, there's some off ice issues with him. Um, you know, like do you... he clearly has a drug problem. I mean, the photos surfaced years ago. Yeah. Was it at where, was where it was it? Cup? Was it after their cup win? I thought. Yeah. I mean, look, there's been lots of photos. The caps have been embarrassed. And I believe at some point earlier this season, as he's been asking for a trade for a long time, they've been frustrated with him. He's been frustrated with them. And I believe at some point very early on in the season, or maybe in dating back to last off season, they, they basically said it, it's zero tolerance from here on out. Yeah. Next issue. Next thing that pops up, you know, we're going to have to do something here because it's not working for us. And that part 
obviously he he ends up this year in the player assistance program. And I thought maybe the most interesting part of that was that while Kuznetsov was out of the lineup, this team actually played their best hockey of the season. Yeah. So he hasn't played since January 27th. And the Caps in that span of time are... Let me um, math. They said there would be no math here. Why do I have to do math? Uh, they are six, five, and two. But it's not just been record. It's been eye test. Yeah. yeah. And I think they've gotten rid of his also at times negative attitude that has been problematic. And now he's going to Hershey as the highest salaried player ever for an extended stay in in Hershey. Yeah. Well, there's Eight a million guy bucks that... a year, seven point eight million dollar cap it. It's never good when you're in the Wade Redden territory, but he's even north of that. And I had some people tweet me and say, Well, what about Carrie Price? Carrie Price yeah. is on a one game conditioning stint. That doesn't count. This is someone yeah. who's actually been assigned to yeah. uh to well Hershey. we'll see it we'll see how serious he is about resurrecting his career frank and getting his life in order off the ice just you know what if he goes down there if that guy doesn't light it up in the ahl there's a big problem no question well, in my mind like he some people have said well he what if he doesn't report i mean yeah. for the caps it would be the best thing to ever happen yeah he's not he's not not reporting he's just losing all he his has money to go yeah, I don't see that happening. Would you so, walk for, or, or if you were an agent, would you let your client walk for 10, 10 million bucks? Leave it on the table? Yeah, that would be a, that would be not a wise decision. So, um, yeah. Who knows? I don't Maybe he that. feels like with the 54 million he's already made, he's got more than enough money. But hey, yeah, their GM's going to be busy this week, Frank. They got lots of pieces. Like there's a shortage of defensemen available around the league. And a Joel Edmondson's playing 22 minutes in Washington. I don't see that, you know, the last games anyway. I don't see that happening on any other team, but you know what? Uh, he'll have some value, especially because he's already being chopped. If Washington needs half, like he's less than a million dollars, he's like 850 grand. Like he's a, that's a really, that's a good depth defender to get on your team. You know, the third pairing guy. And uh, you know, I think there'll be lots of interest in Joel Edmondson. Uh, Nick Dow's been out. You talk about it. They're still competing. Um, if the returns as high as people say, God, you probably have to trade him too. So, and then there's Mantha, which is kind of a wild card. He's had an unreal season. And I know there's, there's mixed reviews, Frank, from some of the GMs you talk to. I talked to some who quite like him and then others are, I'm not sure, but either way, I think uh, he's another guy that would, would garner some interest here this week. I mean, Brian McClellan hit it right on the head on Saturday when discussing the Kuznetsov waivers saying the the priority the top priority for our team is the future they're not yeah. going to be trying to put band-aids on this they understand the position that they're in they were one of the most competitive teams in the league not unlike the penguins they don't have as many cups to show for it but for 14 years oh god yes they won president's trophies they won a stanley cup they had scoring titles everything you could want in that period of time but that that runs over and like the penguins, it ended last year and now they've, they're in a spot where Nick Dowd, you mentioned, I think he's anywhere from a late first round pick to a second and a third or a second and a fourth. Joel Edmondson is going to be a, you know, bottom pair insurance piece that it, you're right. If they, they chop that, they can maybe find a little mid round, late round pick value. Um, and then it gets interesting. Who are some of the other guys that they would consider trading? And there's no doubt that they should be as active as they possibly can be. But I thought it was interesting to hear Brian McClellan mention specifically that they're also looking to get younger. So the type of deal that they made last year acquiring Rasmus Sandin for a first. Think about that. They took yep. the picks that they got from the Orlov Hathaway deal, at least one of them, and traded it to Toronto to get Sandin. Yep. 
someone who has more time than me this week could potentially go through if you're a Caps fan and suss out which young players are operating on the fringes of their current team that have some pedigree and have some upside that the Caps could target yeah. with whatever capital they get in return. Well, it's uh, it's intriguing that uh, that trade definitely showed where I, I think their strategy is, and that's why I think they're going to be a busy uh, team this week. Can I, can I ask you a dumb thing? Yeah. If if you like watching Rasmus Sandin now for another year, would you, was that a smart move or not smart? By Washington or Toronto? By Washington. Yeah, he he's kind of who you thought he was right like i think he's i think he's a good player he's not um like late first rounders well it wasn't that late i guess but um that's a good question yeah, it was Fred. a late first rounder it was boston's pick right oh right yeah okay so it was late um i think i'm still i don't know what he is yet right this might this thing is this might all be he is right but like he shows the potential of like you know he could be I think it could be a number, like a really solid number five. I think that's probably the ceiling for him. And there's nothing wrong with, like, if you have a really good number five on your team, you're pretty happy. But that's kind of where I see is, you know, on a competitive team. Because some guys will play top four on non-playoff teams, Frank. It's very different than being a top four big minute eater guy on, on a top end team. So um, he has the potential. He, like a lot of young defensemen, you know, defensively he's not ideal. And his consistency is the one thing I'm sure if you talk to anybody that, you need a little bit more consistency. Coaches like to know, okay, I see here, Sarah Valley. I know exactly what I'm getting from Sarah Valley, game in and game out. And I'm not sure he's there yet, but you could say that about a lot of players. He turns 24 in three days. So yeah, like that's young, young man. But young, but not insanely young. No, but you know, age is one factor. I that you you just to me, I'm a I'm a big, you know, I'm a big believer in um in the uh you know guys and, and especially defensemen and games played. And just the experience where the game slows down, um, especially defensively, you know, they're not running around and making, you know, ridiculous plays all the time. So that to me is like, you know what? He's not a huge offensive guy. That's, I guess my question is like, he's not offensive enough at his size to me ever be a top four guy. So that's why I think at best, he's a number five at best. And maybe he's number six, like who's the puck. All right. Right. 211 um, games. All, all I'm saying is, it's an interesting move if you're Washington, but were they better off doing something else? Well, you never know, right? Like what's, what, what, what's, well, first of all, we'd have to go look, we'll see what was the pick and now, and just, just because one team picks a player doesn't mean that's the player they would have picked. Right. But we got to sure. look and say, okay, who are the guys around them? And then in five years would have been better. Right. Like I think Washington at the time needed help on their blue line. I think that's obvious. Right. So Guess who that pick ended up being who Easton Cowan who has had an absolute monster year for yeah. the London Knights. Nah, and hey, and, and some people guys. consider him now an untouchable for the Leafs. Yeah. Well, then Which, you know what? it was a Great lot of people. A lot of people panned that pick at the time as, oh my God, this is such a reach. We never had him on our board anywhere near this. And he yeah. has been an absolute stud this year for the Knights. 83 points in 47 games. Oh, Hey, you know what, man? Really good player. Him and uh, what is it? I think it's Barky is his uh, is his line mate there. There, I think they both have eighty plus points, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, I uh, I'm always had like guys put up big numbers in junior and Denver know. Barky. He signed with the Flyers this weekend. Yeah, there you his go. His entry level contract. Yeah. So, yeah, I think they're both like eighty three and eighty five or something like that, right? Yeah, Barky's at eighty seven. Oh, okay, there you go. I was close. Um, yeah, that's turned out to be, you know, we'll see if, Hey, it becomes, then it's a great trade, right? Like there's, there's always a, a risk both ways for any team. When you trade away a first that, Hey, the guy might pan out for you. And, um, I could see Washington, maybe they were a little bit, um, a little bit desperate. And they obviously at the time felt like, Hey, Sundin comes here. You know what? He could help us right away next season as we try yes. and get back in this. Yes. hundred percent. Right. And, you know, we got Carlson. That was the other thing. They were so banged up at the time of that trade, right? Like he came yep. in last year to Washington and God, didn't he have like 15 points in 20 games or something? Like he was mm -hmm. on fire. Now, granted, you know, he was getting more offensive opportunity. And so maybe they view him, honestly, Frank, as a guy who's going to replace Carlson down the road. They'll just be patient and just tell him, hey, bide your time. You're going to get it. Because 
When he got some power play time, he put up points. Yep. Now, few teams as we're into the week of the trade deadline, Frank, the Oilers, the Avs, the Golden Knights. Three of the uh, top teams. We've already seen Dallas make their trade in Tanev. We've seen Vancouver make their moves. They've been making trades all year. Winnipeg's made their one big move. They might make another one. But those three teams haven't. And, man, you look at Vegas lately. I know they're injured, but suddenly the L.A. Kings have a higher points percentage than Vegas. Vegas has the seventh highest points percentage now in the West. Like, they're they're on has the Has any break. team been more banged up than the Golden Knights? No, not at all. I mean, they missed Aiden Hill for a chunk of time. Shea Theodore forever. Jack Eichel. Now Mark Stone. It's not just guys on their roster. It's impact star level contributors. Oh, dude, that it's huge. How do you how do you compete without those guys? Well, that's why I chuckled when everyone's like, "Oh, look at Vegas, Mark Stone. They're gonna screw LTR." And I'm like, "Um, all they're doing is dropping down the standings here, right? He has a lacerated spleen, right? First of all, I don't know if if now I get that you get upset if you wait, but like I tell people all the time, guys go on LTIR in the middle of the season. So if Jack Eichel right now gets held out an extra week because they want him to be healthy, no one even bats an eye. But if you hold him out an extra week at the end of the regular season, the conspiracy theories go crazy. So um, I don't, I'd be sh- I, I, Look, I don't know this for sure, but knowing what I know about his lacerated spleen, oh, I'm, dude, I'm told that God. there was some internal bleeding. Yes. That it's also, by the way, fun medical fact, Dr. Saravalli here, uh, that it's the internal organ most likely to bleed and most dangerous if it does bleed. Um, that he, I'd be surprised if he's ready for the first round. Oh, I hundred percent agree with you. I actually bet some guys for charity about that. I'm like, you guys are like this. Is, I know it's, it's the third year in a row, Frank, that Mark Stone's been injured. He got placed on LTR. Uh, two years ago, he came back and they didn't make the playoffs. Last year, he came back just in time for the playoffs. Great. And so they think, oh, they do it once. It's cap circumvention. I'm like, first of all, unfortunately for Mark Stone, he's become injury prone in the second half of the season. That's the reality here. And it's really unfortunate. Like a lacerated he's, spleen, there's nothing you can train to do to, to make that not happen, right? It's very unfortunate. But He's the well, heartbeat of their team. You think yes. they want him not in their lineup? Oh, God. I totally agree with you. So what do you think they're going to do here? I, oh, I think they're going to make the biggest splash possible. They're going to use every red cent of that nine and a half million dollars if they can find a proper use for it. I think they're going to go after Barbashev or Gensel or whoever one of those wingers is that's top flight. Bar- whoa, whoa, whoa. No, no, not Barbashev. I meant to say yeah. Buchnevich, the other Butch Russian Nevich, from okay. St. Louis. I'm like, wow, is his twin brother coming to the league? But oh, hey, yeah, look, no, Butch- Barbashev Butch worked out quite well coming over from St. Louis yes. last year. So, yes. Buchnevich, I think, is Barbashev on steroids. Well, if you're Vegas, because think about, so now you're going to have to give up more assets, Frank, right? For a guy who, even even as good as those guys are, they're not going to bring the emotional point to the team that Mark Stone brings. I don't think anyone questions that Stone's their emotional leader, right? Like, and I know Vegas won the cup, so I get they're competitive. They probably don't care about the future, but like, I wonder, is this the year for them to throw all their chips in and give up all the pieces that it would take to acquire those guys? Well, Buchnevich makes more sense to me in that sense because he has term. Yeah, 100%. And I know that they would then need to figure out some of their cap this summer, but you do have the cap increase coming, plus you have um, someone like Alec Martinez coming off your books at $5 million and change. That's That's real money to be able to go out and spend. So... Basically what you could do, and I know they're different positions, but you could take that money from Martinez five to five and, and essentially for next year, slide that to Buchnevich up front. I see him being an a plus fit there. Okay. And I know I've said it before, but name for me a point per game player in the league that gets less attention than him. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, he's, you know, Cairo and Thomas get a lot of the talk there. But yeah, Buchanan, that's been an unreal acquisition for the Blues ever since they got him from the Rangers. It was a salary cap dump. Yeah. The, the Rangers couldn't afford to re-sign him as an RFA. And I every time I say this, it blows everyone's mind. 194 games played in St. Louis, 191 points. Yeah. 
It's pretty good. 30 player. goals, 26, 24. He's on track to get close to 30 again. Yeah. I mean, what what more do you want for an RFA pickup? Yeah. Well, if you're the Blues, like I'd make the argument, I'd try to re-sign Buchnevich. Keep him on my team. He's a good player. Well, that's the thing. He's now vaulted himself into $8 million a year territory. I don't see the Blues re-signing him. That, yeah, and no. that's why he's available. He may not be traded now. It may wait until the summer. It could wait until next deadline. I just, I don't think he's long for St. Louis. And by the way, do the Rangers just go after him? Do they go and reacquire him? Eh, maybe. But the I would Rangers put, good, I would put, I, I think he makes a lot of sense for Edmonton too. And I know I've talked about that, but same reason applies. If you're the Oilers, you'd, you'd prefer to have a non rental if you could. Oh, ca cap space gets tight. Yeah. But if you're talking about someone to fill out your top six on that right side, I mean, that works for me. 100%. Yeah. No, he checks a lot of boxes. There's no question about it. Um, you know, the orders are going to make some moves this week. Will they have the big splash of the top six? Um, you know, they're not. You know, I know people have talked about it. I don't expect them to add a goaltender, but they're going to add a depth defense when like a lot of teams are. And it really comes down to, you know, how much will they augment their fourth line? And uh, will they find a trade for the top six winger? Right. Like, I do know that uh, if Tyler Toffoli is available, Frank, they would have significant interest. Makes sense. And sending him back to Alberta. Yeah. He had been there somewhat recently. Had success. I know, yeah, I know on the other side of the rivalry, but still, um, I could see that for sure. I, I truly believe that on Monday, March 4th, we're doing this at 10.39 a.m. Eastern. I don't think the, the Oilers have their, they're not laser focused on any one thing. I think they're still all over the place. Yeah. And I don't mean that as a negative. I mean it as they're trying to weigh out acquisition cost with the other collateral moves that they're going to have to make. I mean, there's a reason why Brett Kulak and Warren Fogle are on our trade board. They might have to move out players. And I know Ken Holland in the last week or two has spent time gauging what that market is like. If they need to unload one of those players in a deal independent of whatever trade he's making. Yeah. Well, the other thing I found interesting about Edmonton was kind of like yesterday, a few of the players mentioned, like they still got their sight sets on first place in the Pacific and uh, they passed Vegas now and uh, they're nine back of Vancouver with four games in hand. And uh, it's, you know, they do have the one game left head to head in April and uh, Vancouver beat them for fun earlier in the season, three straight times. And, you know, that, that early season swoon of 12 games, you know, might cost the orders first in the division, but man, they've been playing very well. Um, Actually, best record in the NHL since Knobloch got hired by uh, by a fairly significant margin, and you know, so I look at at Edmonton, and you know what? I, I think I think their their team has shown management like they've been playing 750 hockey under Knobloch, Frank 34 11 and one, right? Mm -hmm. um, they got the best points per second percentage in the league. They've got the uh, the most goals uh, scored in the league. They've got uh, fifth most uh, or fifth fewest goals against in the NHL. Their power play is is a third in that time. Their penalty kill is fifth. Like I think they're first in five on five goals. They're fourth in five on five goals against. Like they've been very good. Like to me, there's it's be inexcusable if they don't make a few significant moves. Now, significant doesn't have to be big name, but if you improve your fourth line center spot, Frank, by three, four, five percent, that's pretty significant to me. Wouldn't it make sense to kill a few of these birds with one stone? Do it, do one package deal. Pick a team like Washington. Oh, Washington's got Washington's got a lot of pieces they could use. You got Dowd, you got Mantha, you got Edmondson. Yes, you can make a package there. That's the team that makes the most sense. Yeah, and you don't need to do all three at once, but no. you could do two of them. Yes. And they have cap space. They'd probably be willing to take back a Fogel or take back someone that they could then use just till the rest of the season, or then they could take him and flip them. Oh, yeah, I know there's... The There's posture becomes options. a lot different if Washington has Fogel to flip as opposed to the Oilers. Because Fogel, 
he's already have tied a career his career year. high in goals and he's he's got a career high in points. Yes. And he's still got time to go. Like 2.75, his contract isn't really out of whack. It's just that relative to the the rest of the Oilers lineup, he's the one guy you can take off that could actually clear a decent chunk of space. Yeah, and the problem is like he was really good. Like he's kind of built as a playoff player, right? Like he was quite good in the playoffs for them last year. So I yeah, think that's, but, there might be hesitant, but I agree. Like, Hey, if you can upgrade for a Booch Navich or somebody, then of course I think you're doing it. Right. My point is he's not coming back. So if you're going to have to pry a player off, he makes yeah. sense. And yeah. what I'm saying is Edmonton looking to move Fogel, a team looks at that and says, you're going to have to pay us. We're not letting you out of jail for free. But if Washington has Fogel, then Fogel's an interesting piece to add at the deadline is my point. So if you're able to get out ahead of it enough, the Caps could have a decent flippable asset in a few days' time. So you're telling me, Frank, there's no team that will uh, help the orders like Carolina did last year on Yesa Pogliarvi? <laughs> well, yeah, that one was odd. <laughs> like, that was a stellar trade by Ken. Uh, that trade probably doesn't get talked about enough. That trade led to the Matias Ekholm trade. If he can't convince Carolina to take Yesa Pugliarvi and all $3 million for just a, basically a 50-man roster spot and Patrick uh, Pistola just to you know uh, get a number off their cap, that was an amazing trade for Ken Holland because that led to the uh, Matias Ekholm trade. They didn't have cap space to do it otherwise. But that's exactly the, those are exactly the type of calls that he's making right now. Like yep. Chicago is one of those teams to watch as a place that might be willing to take a forward for very little, like Fogel. Because yeah. Fogel, you could see a team desperate for some support. Oh, yeah, we'll take Fogel. Like, why not? Oh, he's a good player. Like, He's I, a usable if, player. If you traded him to Washington, Frank, he would be swapped right away to another playoff bound team. Right. Or if, if someone's asking you or they're making it as part of the detriment of the deal, trade him independently to somewhere else for, for nothing, and you don't have to pay to get out of it. Yeah. No, they definitely could. Uh, there's options here to be fun. Now, before we get to uh, bu to um, buy or sell, I do want to. Uh, we didn't talk, talk about, about the abs. Okay, go to the abs. Well, no, just I I'm surprised at how quiet they've been. Yeah, I know that they're on the the cusp of getting Nachushkin back, which is huge. If you squint hard enough, you can see Landeskog coming back probably sometime in May if they play that long, which would be unbelievable. But second line center and backup goalie are their two needs. And they need, they certainly need someone with more cachet than Eustace Ananen to, to back up. Yeah. And Georgiev has played too much. And by the way, his numbers are really just middling as a whole. I well, think this is my own personal opinion. I can't think of a more ideal fit for Jake Allen. You have the Habs retain half that knocks them down to one nine for this year and next. You solve your problem for next year. It's not going to cost you a lot to do. Boom, that's one of them. The second line center spot is a bit harder to figure. Because, Adam Henrique. Well, unless you think that Henrique can actually be an authentic 2C, I think he's more of a 3C. Er. But maybe some combination of Henrique and Johansson alternating or trying to find chemistry and fit. I just. The one other part about Henrique is he's just not fast. And that yeah. team plays with pace that I just stylistically, I don't know if they're if if he's a real fit. Well, and the problem is there's not a lot of other second line center options available. That that's my point. I said it's pretty hard to figure out. Yeah. So unless there's someone somewhere from another team that has term that Colorado's looking at, I'm real curious to see what the, what they get up to. And to put a bow on this part of the conversation, I would be absolutely floored if we wake up on Saturday morning and the Avs, Golden Knights, and Oilers all haven't traded their first round pick and haven't made a big splash. Oh, you think the Oilers might move their first, didn't you? All right. I think if they you don't move think their they first, will? Well, I think if they get a guy with term, yes. I don't think they're giving up their first for a pure rental. I think their owner is pounding his fist on the table saying, let's go. Oh yeah, well he they could. Yeah, I just I'd look be, at like I'd which be surprised players do you, if they kept it. Which players do you think are and you could that's totally valid. 
But which players do you think are like without question worth a first rounder? Jake Gensel, Pavel Buchnevich. Yeah, I see term. I agree there. Um, but there's not many, right? I just want to make sure I'm not missing someone. I would trade a first for Tyler Toffoli. Really? Hmm. Yep. Okay. If it was part of a package, I'd probably give up a first for Nick Dowd. Uh, Meaning term. you get multiple players. Yeah, you get multiple terms, and he's got a sick cap hit. Like Toffoli, I think, when I look at the Tanev trade, I'm like, man, I might be able to squeeze a prospect in a second for Toffoli. I think that's it, though. Yeah, there's not many. So, um, that, but you're right. I think the uh, the orders are good. So I can see why their owner's like, hey, let's get going here. And, you know, I think Jeff Jackson and Ken Holland, between the two of them, are um, are pretty aggressive right now. So it'll be uh, – It'll be fun. Now, speaking of aggressive, Frank, uh, you were bang on with the uh, Elias Pettersson. Uh, not only that, uh, you know, first of all, it was going to be eight years because I saw some people try. Oh, no, it's going to be shorter. Well, obviously, it wasn't. Uh, it was an eight year deal. Uh, came in a little bit lower than 12 million at 11.6. So, you know, I was I was looking at the uh, the salaries for next season and, you know, Pettersson comes in. Uh, I think he's sixth or seventh, fifth, actually, um, at 11.6 for for eight years. Um, I'm not saying it's a bargain deal. I think it's a pretty fair contract. He gets money. Vancouver gets eight years. I can't think of a more fair contract for everyone involved. Well, well Pasternak, I really like that deal. Well, but I would say that's not really fair for him. I think he's on the oh. short end of the stick. Okay. I think he's underpaid. Yeah. I think probably. Pedersen is paid just right. And I think... Four years into this deal, when the cap is 103 oh. million bucks, we're going to be like, this deal is a bargain. Yeah, no, it's definitely has the potential, Frank. And year they age really six, well, year six, seven, and eight, Vancouver fans are gonna be like, geez, we got one of the best contracts in the league, right? Kind of like a, a Leon Dry Saddle contract right now. I'm not saying Pedersen's gonna win a heart or anything, he might, yep. but um, you know, like a you know, I'm not sure it'd be like the, the massive savings where McKinnon was like five million underpaid for for the last few years of his deal, but it'll, it should age. Well, I would agree with you. He doesn't look like a player. You know what? He's got such a great shot. He's, he's, he's not a slow skater who's suddenly going to slow down. So I think long-term this age as well. I think he's got a really, really good chance over these eight years to, to be hovering right in that top five in the league. Back to back 100 point seasons. Now he's on track for, I, I, I think it, I think it's incredibly fair for everyone. He gets ninety three million dollars. The Canucks get an eight year commitment. I mean, what what more could you ask for? It's a two year slog for the Canucks to get to this point, and now it changes everything about the look and feel of their team. What was once a big question mark is now a sure thing. Yeah. I'll say this, Frank. I think there's a very good chance that he ends up being the all-time leading scorer in Canucks history if he finishes that eight-year term. Makes sense to me. By the way, did you find it really interesting that in the breakdown of the Pedersen deal, that in 2026-27, he got $47 bucks total in signing bonus, but he yeah. did not get $1 in signing bonus for 2026-27. Yeah. Oh, they're probably looking ahead to... You know, I don't want to read anything too negatively, but I think there's an ownership group saying we can never trust our negotiating, so let's not get uh, screwed over. It is interesting. No, they're they're, they're saying that's not what their ownership group is saying. The ownership group is saying that's a year we're very likely to have a lockout, and I'm not paying signing bonus. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, we're, they're worried about getting the negotiation from the CBA. Oh, I thought you meant negotiation in terms of if the contract goes sideways. No, 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 no. For, this, for the CBA, no, no, no. Um, do you notice a difference though? Um, exact same cap hit, but uh, William Nylander has 69 million in bonuses and it's 47 to Pedersen. So that's a significant difference that a lot of people, you know what, when you're able to um, to get all that money in one lump sum, you invested properly over the year, that's a big advantage. So that's 22 million more in bonuses for Nylander than Pedersen, even though they have the exact same cap hit. I think Pedersen is going to be just fine. Oh God, yes, no. I like the Pedersen deal better. He's a centerman over a winger. So that's how, that's how I view that.
Uh, let's get Tyler Uramchuk is uh, is away today, so uh, I will fill in time now for fill in the blank delivered by DoorDash. Restaurants and more delivered right to your door. You can even try the new Double Dash feature, one of Frank's favorites. It allows you to add a second stop to order with no extra delivery fees. For a limited time, our listeners can get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of 15 bucks or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter the code NATION25. You'll see it on our screen if you're watching or if you're listening, NATION25. Try it right now. So, uh, Frank, the team that is the biggest lock to trade their first round pick this week is blank. The Vegas Golden Knights. Okay, I am. Uh, I'm going the Colorado Avalanche is my uh, my lock for the uh, the first. Just well, a Vegas reminder will... that the Avs did not trade their first round pick the year that they won the cup. Yes, that's I know. I'd be, people talk about it, and um, so and well, I let's just it. but let so hold on a second. We just said how many players on that board are worth a first round pick. Yeah. I don't think there's many. So we just then said that the Avs need a center and none of those players that we talked about were centers. But guess so what? How do you envision them getting there? Because I think they might switch and they might just go to a, get another scoring winger and be like, you know what? Well, we'll we, if we can get Jake Gensel for argument's sake, and I'm not solely get traded, we think Jake Gensel, who's a hell of a player on his own right, he can make Ryan Johansson a better second line center. Worst case scenario. I don't know. I okay. Interesting yeah. bet. Yeah. So, but I like. I don't think there's going to be a massive run of first rounders. But again, I could easily be wrong. Hey guys, the team that will move out the most pieces this week is blank. I am going to go with the team we talked about earlier, Frank. I'm saying the Washington Capitals. I think they're going to move out three or maybe four pieces. Washington's a good pick. You've got to go with their arch nemesis and the Penguins as well. Yeah. And I'll give you two wild cards. One would be the Minnesota Wild. Ooh, Billy Guerin. So we know they're keeping Mark andre Fleury. They've essentially made a pact and said, we're not trading you. And he said, I don't want to be traded. Yeah. But that leaves Brandon Duhame, Pat Maroon, Zach Bogosian. Zach Bogosian. Am I missing anyone? I'm trying to think. I don't um, think so. So that's no. potential of three. And then yeah. the Arizona Coyotes are definitely going to move Zucker. And Dumba for sure. Now the question is on a pure volume basis, is there someone else, a lower tier UFA, I don't know, Josh Brown, pick a guy that someone says, Oh yeah, I'll take him for a depth D delete round pick. I, I need another set. Like, because a few GMs tell me they, they want to go into the playoffs as a cup contender with eight defense when they think can play. Obviously, your eighth is going to be a drop off from your top six, but yep. So yeah, Josh Brown would fit. That another guy, Frank, you mentioned in Minnesota, Alex Goligoski. I think he's a UFA, right? He's making two sheets. He could be a guy. Uh, I don't think Golog Goligoski would refuse to waive his no trade last year. Oh, okay. So I don't I don't think he's going anywhere. Even if he's and going I would cup contender. No, and I think that this is the end of the road for Alex uh, Goligoski yeah. in his career. Yeah, well, that could be it. But And no one really knows what the Seattle Kraken are up to. What's going on with Jordan Eberle? What about... Um, Wenberg? Yeah, Schultz. Alex Wenberg. Don't know. No one knows. Ron Francis is a mystery. He's a Do mystery as mysterious as the Kraken in the depths of the ocean. Oh, yeah. He doesn't uh, say much. Pretty tight to the vest. Um, uh, last fill in the blank brought to you by DoorDash. After his comments over the weekend, there is a blank percent chance that the Flames will trade Jacob Markstrom. 25%. I, I'm glad you brought that up because I did want to clarify. I don't think Jacob Markstrom's issue with the flames front office is at all with Craig Conroy. And I saw it written that way. And I thought that was disappointing 
because I thought that person, their reporting doesn't have not to, you know, knock on anyone, but they don't have the full depth of the story. My understanding, and this is a belief I've had for three weeks or a month now, is that the Flames and Devils had agreed to a trade with on Markstrom. They had gone to Markstrom and said, we're thinking about trading you to New Jersey. What are your thoughts? He gave them the green light. I don't know if he actually had a piece of paper in front of him or not. The two sides, I believe, had agreed in principle to a trade and then above Craig Conroy, so if you're reading between the lines and picking up what I'm putting down here, Don Maloney, on behalf of ownership, is believed to have nixed this trade. Hmm. So I think Markstrom's frustration is, you asked me if I would waive. I said yes. Then you don't trade me? Yeah. And then you discern after the fact that you're not going to trade me or you've told people that you're not going to trade me. Yeah. I could understand why that would be disappointing. And I think from Markstrom's perspective, he's a really competitive guy. He wants a chance to win. He doesn't, he doesn't want to sit here and languish. Not to, not to say that that's going to end up happening because I do think they'll trade him in the summer. And it makes sense because there's probably going to be four or five teams that are in the mix for Markstrom. They're in a great position when it comes to the goalie market. They're going to have everyone all over Markstrom. But in the meantime, he knows that over this contract with two years left, he doesn't have a chance to win in Calgary. And that part, I think, is is probably bothering him. Yeah. I'm going to say like, I'm going even lower. I think it's like a 10% chance he gets dealt before Friday. I think. Um... You know, cost, everything else. I'm not sure how many other teams uh, can make it happen if it's not New Jersey. And so uh, I would agree with you, Frank. It definitely uh, is pointing more to a summertime trade. So uh, there's always a surprise. No, uh, there's a surprise. Sometimes you don't know a guy's available. And maybe a team's willing to make a, a massive splash we're not aware of. So that's why I'll still I'll leave 10% open. But yeah. I think if good. not New Jersey, I don't know who it would be. No, exactly. But I, I think... Maybe if you're in New Jersey and you're sitting there, despite everything that we just said about the Devils to start the pod, maybe they're thinking that a goaltender will save their season and that they could get in over these last 20 games, then yeah. Markstrom would be it. That's why I left it at 25%, which you know is probably big, about what the, the Devils' playoff chances are. The big swing, Frank, out of left field, the team that actually could use Markstrom the most would be Colorado. I'm not sold on George Ev as a starter. Like I think uh, I don't get, think they're they're not gonna they're not gonna no play. no but I'm just saying the team that could really benefit from them I I, I disagree mine would be the Kings Ooh. yeah yeah that's not bad why wouldn't um, he fit with L A like they don't mind older goalies they've had a good run from quick they just don't spend they haven't spent a lot on goalies they don't have the cap space per se but if really the Flames are gonna retain some. Or if whatever, that that would seem to make sense for me. Like I would have to put the Kings on those on that list for Markstrom this summer. Talbot's up. Yeah. I, is Copley up? I think, and he's coming off of knee surgery. And yeah. Riddick is up, right? Yeah. Oh no, they're looking to switch it around. They'd have to move some guys out for sure. But yeah, their goal ten is I think are all UFAs, are they not? So. I know Riddich and, and Talbot definitely are, but they're making a combined one. They're making less than two million, I think, between the two of them. That's that's their challenge. Yeah, so. Talbot has a performance bonus of a million bucks this year. Oh, okay. Well, there you but go. that's two. But they've spent less than three million dollars on goaltending this year. Well, that wraps up uh, fill in the blanks. Brought to you by DoorDash. Use the promo code Nation. 25. Um, a few other things, Frank. It's busy. There's so much to get to. Uh, we didn't talk about them yet. Uh, they're still in third place in the Metro. There's been all the rumblings about what they're going to do. They said, hey, you know what? If, regardless of where we're at, we might make some trades and that won't look like uh, where we are in the standings. Do you still think about that? Or do you think the Flyers are like, damn, it's now March 4th. We're in a playoff spot. We continue to be in a playoff spot. Even, you know, we've lost Carter Hart. We're not losing any steam. Do we maybe then pump the brakes on trades? I don't think they should. I think it should be full steam ahead, especially when it comes to Walker and Sealer. I know that 
John Tortorella professed his love for Sealer after the game the other night, basically saying, we're not trying to move this guy. He's as competitive a player as I've ever coached. Yeah. I really, you, I, Nick Sealer is one of my favorite players in the NHL to watch. I've been calling him Nicky Nails all season. He's like a human nail gun out there. Love him. But I really love him at 800,000 bucks. I don't know that I love him at three something, $3 million. Do you think it gets that big of a raise? Oh, yeah. Really? And I think Sean Walker has been talking somewhere in the neighborhood of $5 million a year. The Flyers are in this spot where they're going to get caught up in exactly what you were just talking about. That's what it feels like. Yeah. And I think I, I cannot say strongly enough how much I think that would be a mistake. Okay. I just, I watched some games that they played this past week. The Caps up to nothing. Oh, that give was up terrible. five. They lost to the Penguins seven six <laughs> the previous Sunday. I know they beat the Lightning, but they trailed for the bulk of that game or most of it and then had a, a spurt in the third period. And I know they beat a banged up Sens team. I just, you have to know what you are. And the Flyers are a team that regardless of whatever happened this year and how well they've played, I think they are very, very likely to be a non-playoff team next year. You know, I it's hard to argue that, Frank. Like, it is. I, I think they're a team that they're feeling mojo they got a lot of guys in their team feeling good about their game they got up to a start and that's able to you know build some confidence you know tortorella can can fire guys up and get them emotionally charged and but eventually over time and i would agree with you i could see that continuing this year the summer comes now maybe they surprise us and they go out and make a few additions we're not expecting but when i look at their current roster and guys coming i don't it looks it would be a little challenging for me to think that it's very repeatable for them. Because even if they do make the playoffs, Frank, it's not like they're a, like a, a lock playoff team, right? But who are they going to beat in the first round? Yeah. Yeah, Carolina, the Rangers, or probably Carolina. That'd be a, it's, it's not a great matchup, no question. So I don't care if the value, quote-unquote, isn't what you think it should be for Sean Walker. It should still be a second-round pick. But you got him for nothing last year. And he was a cap casualty. He's much more likely at some point over the next three or four years or however long you'd be signing him for to be a cap casualty than he is to be a, a, a bona fide player worth $5 million a year. No. I think. And, and I think you have to play that game and just, you know, as tough as it may be to sit back and say, we've had a great year. We'd love to reward our players and our fans. But man, we got to just get while the getting's good. Well, they did give up pro Rob in that deal. So it's not like they got Walker for nothing, but um, Sean yeah. Walker was a healthy scratch last year for the Los Angeles. Kings oh, no, I understand the playoffs, that. but I'm just and saying they, they had too many up. right shot defensemen and they needed to trade one. Yes. Yeah. But I'm just saying they gave up pro Rob. It's not like nothing. It wasn't the Chris Draper dollar trade. <laughs> no, but they're, or tra they were trying to move Provorov because they didn't think he was a fit culturally. Yeah, no, that's fair. Speaking of a uh, dollar trades, Frank, did you know that Ray Shepard got traded for a dollar as well when he's a 24 goal scorer? No. And then he turned into be a 52 goal scorer. So one of the few 50 goal scorers who was traded and then scored 50 goals, uh, never scoring 50 before. So so many guys have done that. So just a random fact of the that's day. That's a great though, connection, a great segue to the Panthers. Yes. What do Panthers? We haven't talked about Panthers. Hannafin. We'll get to that. Uh, do you see a connection there? Do you see, what do you think they're going to do? No, I, I mean, I, I reported a few weeks ago that Noah Hannafin's preferred destination was the, the Tampa Bay lightning. It still is. The, the Panthers have been a team that has certainly made calls. He Hannafin I'm told would resign there. So they're on his list. Um, here's the thing. The Panthers, much like the Lightning, don't have very many assets. No. They're uh they're shopping at Gucci, but they've got a Walmart budget. And and that's oh, that's God. fact. 
So they're they're going to have to try and figure that out. I think they're going to go through and work through this process. They're going to try and improve their team as much as they can. And here's the funny thing. I wouldn't be surprised if in order to make something happen that Bill Zito moves a roster player, one of his pending free agents, in order to make it happen. Now, not Sam Reinhardt, but Nick Cousins or Kevin Stenland or one of his UFA defensemen in order to make this happen. Hmm. Is there someone that has value? How do we find the the requisite cap space. He's open to just about anything. And I think short of Brad tree living, I don't know if another GM in the league has made more calls this deadline period than Bill Zito. Well, it's uh that'll be fascinating to watch. Like there's some really good teams that like Florida, Colorado, Vegas, Edmonton, that have yet to make some moves, Frank. And I think that's what makes the, uh, this week exciting. Well, now what about the predators? Here's the Preds are on fire. They've won eight in a row and they've, uh, you know, they've created some pretty good separation for them in the, uh, in the Western conference uh, wildcard race. They're, they're tied with LA at, uh, at 72 points. Uh, they are seven up on the flames and blues. Now those two teams have two games in hand, but we, you know, and, and the flames have won five in a row, Frank, that's the yeah. thing, right? Like they've won five in a row and gained no ground. So they've probably got to be annoyed. Not that I think, you know, they'd still like to make playoffs. They're still going to trade guys, but um, what do you make of the predators? Should, do you think they'll make a, a subtle move or two? By the way, there is a Preds and Flames connection. My prediction is if the Preds, not if, the Preds are going to be trading Tyson Barry. But once the Flames move Noah Hannafin, I think they're one of the teams that's expressed interest in Barry as right. a maybe like a thank you to their team to say, yeah, hey, yeah. you guys have worked your butts off. Let's see if we can give you some help on the power play to maybe eke into a playoff spot. The math is pretty daunting with the run that the Preds have been on. But short of Barry, I don't know how much they're going to be selling. I think you have to allow for the possibility of Alexander Carrier because I think they like some young guys that are on the way on defense. So he's a possibility. But I could see Barry Trotz between now and Friday making a couple small additions. I agree. Yes, totally. A team that was not, was in seller mode for a while and ready to consider a ton of different things that they feel like they owe it to their team. So obviously UC Soros isn't moving, um, but I could see them nibbling around the edges, trading on the margins to try and improve this team. No, yeah, wouldn't be surprised at all, man. They, you see Saros game comes around. They are a dangerous team, right? Like they're not um, just uh, dangerous in the sense that they're a hard out, right? In, uh, in how they play. I'm, you know, I'd be surprised if they won a first round, Frank, but I wouldn't be shocked if they won a first round. You know what I mean? Like, I think they're, a, they're, a, they could be a tough, uh, a tough out for a team. Agreed. I think you have a goalie like that. That's someone that's capable of making what should be a pretty easy first round series something uh perilously in doubt yes well frank we'll talk to you uh later this week it's going to be a fun one uh, before we go though of course uh get to dailyfaceoff.com it's trade deadline week at dailyfaceoff.com and you can play the wendy survivor pool frankie did you get it did you get it you were on wednesday what happened i got to i got to day four for the first wow. time ever and i lost in a shootout because i had the Rangers beating the Leafs on Saturday night in Toronto. I made it to the finish line and I fell on my face in the Wendy's daily face off survivor pool. Man, that one hurt. I'm not going to lie. I was watching the game and I was all excited. And my son so is like, what's Max wrong? Domi's your like, least favorite player right now. I'm like, I want, I want free food from Wendy's. Yeah. He cost you the shootout move from Domi. So, and well, the Rangers did tie it late though to get it to overtime. So I know I I text everyone in our in our DFO live group chat and I was like, I'm alive. <laughs> I was I'm telling you, I was live uh, live texting this yeah. Ranger. Well, I, I, hey, my fail day. was worse, Frank. I got the first day right and then I forgot to make my Tuesday pick and then I got knocked out. What an idiot! See, so, that's uh, embarrassing. That was that was terrible. So I will uh, get in if you want to play. Have some fun. I see a few uh, people online are uh, uh, giving us the results of the late starts. They're like, God, I wish I would have been in. They're running the table early. So it's never too 33 late. 33 to people play. out of 520 made it to the finish line last year. Last yeah, week. 33 out of 520. It's harder than it looks. It's definitely harder 
than it looks. Go to dailyfaceoff.com for the Wendy Survivor Pool. You can't miss it. Top right corner, you'll see the, uh, the classic Wendy's logo. Have a great week, everyone. Enjoy the, uh, the trade talk, and uh, we will be back with a little primer right before the deadline.